So this event is being sponsored by the Berkeley Economy and Society Initiative, or BESI, which is our recently launched center um, funded by the Hewlett Foundation. Yay! Actually, yay. yay. And, um, and Simon actually is part of an initiative um, at MIT, which is uh, also part of the uh, Hewlett uh, group. Um, Bessie worked closely with the Social Science Matrix, and we're grateful for their help in uh, hosting this event for us today. Um, I'm supposed to do a commercial for Bessie, so I guess I'll go ahead and do that. Bessie will be co-sponsoring a couple of other events in the next few weeks. Um, there's a panel on October 31st on the state of commercial real estate in San Francisco, and a panel on December 5th on UC Berkeley professor Trevor Jackson's book, Impunity and Capitalism, uh, The Afterlives of European Financial Crises, 1690 to 1830. Um, for those of you who are uh, online, uh, if you're watching this event remotely, uh, we ask that you submit comments and questions through the Q&A feature throughout the conversation. Uh, if you're having AV trouble on Zoom, please contact us through the chat. So um, let me go ahead and make the introduction here. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm really, really pleased to have Simon Johnson here today, who will talk about uh, his new book with us. And, um, and I'm also pleased to have Brad DeLong who will act as our discussant. Uh, Simon will speak for about 30 minutes. Uh, Brad's prepared some remarks for 10, 15 minutes. We'll let them have some uh, rejoinders to each other, and then we'll open up the conversation to the room. Um, so let me begin by saying it's really a great pleasure to introduce Simon Johnson, who's the Ronald Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship and Chair of the Global Economics and Management Group at MIT's Sloan School of Management. Um, Simon was chief economist at the IMF in 2007 and 2008. He's currently co-chair of the CFA Institute Systemic Risk Council. He's co-director of the MIT Shaping the Future of Work Initiative, which is the initiative I was describing a second ago, the Hewlett funded initiative. And he's a board member at Fannie Mae. Simon has wide ranging interests and has made academic contributions uh, on many issues, including the study of the financial sector and economic crises. He's been interested in economic growth issues in advanced emerging market and developing countries. His work has a policy angle, and I expect today we'll have some discussion about the future of work and what government might do to protect uh, workers uh, in the face of AI. Simon is the author of numerous books, including with James Kwan, 13 Bankers, The Wall Street Takeover, which is one of the most influential accounts of the financial crisis. More recently, he wrote with Jonathan Gruber, Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. Today, he will discuss his most recent book uh, with Darren Essigmoglu titled Power and Progress, Our Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. And we have a copy of it here. The book explores the history and economics of major technological transformations up to and including the latest developments in artificial intelligence. And I assume some of you haven't read it, but after today, maybe you'll go off and get a copy. Um, I just want to introduce Brad briefly. Uh, Brad is a professor of economics at UC Berkeley. He's an economic historian who has also studied technological industrial revolutions and the long-term shape of economic history. Brad most recently wrote um, Slouching, Slouching Towards Utopia, another book we have, An Economic History of the 20th Century. And um, I'm really excited to hear Brad's reaction. I can think of no one uh, more qualified around here to say something about uh, Simon and uh, uh, Darren Essamoglu's very ambitious book. And I will turn it over to Simon. So, so I, it, it's a really a great thrill to be here for a number of reasons. Um, one is uh, Brad DeLong is, 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 is a, an icon uh, in, in the intersection between economic history and, and economic policy. Um, and um, when we wrote uh, Power and Progress, I thought we were really, I think it's still too high, Amanda. I thought, there we go. I thought we were really pushing the limit with a 550 page book. It's been on sale in some airports. I never saw anybody take it on a plane. It's way too, way too big. Then I realized that Brad's book is 50 pages longer. And I, and I realized this, and that'll probably be my answer. Any, any, good, any really penetrating um, criticism from, from Brad, I'm going to say, was in the 50 pages I had to cut out in order to, to make my, 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 my word limit. I was also at Stanford. Him, but, you know, my basic books editors at least became increasingly antsy when the page count rose above 350, <laughs> which they regard as the sweet spot for a, you know, trade for a trade book. 
Absolutely. So we're both defying norms and expectations. So I also I also had a I gave a similar talk at, at interaction at Stanford yesterday. It was really very good, very insightful. And I told them I, I was coming to Berkeley today and they were quite intimidated by that. So no pressure at all on your on your side. Uh, I want to talk about um, mostly the ideas in, in power and progress, but also make reference to this other book, Jumpstarting America. And, and I want to lay before you with some historical context some very big questions that I think we're all grappling with today about artificial intelligence, how AI is going to affect work, and, and what policy and whose policy could make a difference there. And, and the way I would frame that, and then sort of it's slightly in the terminology of, of economics, is about technological change and whether we, and we could talk about who we may be, whether we can redirect technological change. Now, what does it mean to redirect technological change? It means to do something deliberately with policy that changes what people spend their time on in terms of trying to invent science and, and apply science, and then rolling that out through the economy in some fashion. So the first question is, can we redirect technological progress, technological change? The second question is, should we redirect it? And the third question, which is the question of, of, of today and going forward, is will we redirect technological change now? So can we redirect technological change? I think actually that that is, is pretty obvious to all of you because we've done it before in this country. We've done it repeatedly. We did it actually most dramatically, perhaps, within recent memory, 66 years ago, when in uh, early October, October 5th, actually, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. That was quite a big shock to the American official and scientific establishment. About a month later, um, the Russians launched another satellite that had a dog in it. Unfortunately, this dog, this particular dog did not come back alive. So the American press, of course, always seizing to cutting to the heart of the issue, said, right, we've got Sputnik and now we have Mutnik. <laughs> The Americans were ready. The, the Navy had a Vanguard rocket. They were able to launch with, with some, you know, they may have cut a few corners. They launched in early December 1957, and immediately upon takeoff, it exploded. So that became Kaputnik <laughs> to the American media. But in, in reaction to that, there was a remarkable bipartisan uh, policy switch led by, of course, President Eisenhower, but with people from both parties um, on, on Capitol Hill that put a lot more money into science and technology. They created NASA, was started in 1958, passed the National Defense Education Act, which many um, people I know and, and many people you've probably uh, met benefited from directly in terms of expanding higher education and providing a financial aid for people to go to college, federal money for the first time at, at, at that scale. These were remarkable achievements. And, and the post-war uh, American uh, prosperity was built in part on this federal commitment to R&D, um, generating large spillover effects, ideas that had actually become much clearer during World War II, when the Americans had first thought about using existing scientific talent in its war effort, uh, the Manhattan Project, you're all familiar with here, radar, which was also um, pioneered and further developed uh, during World War II, and other technological um, improvements, including uh, development of antibiotics. Um, so the Americans had applied science in, in, with, with a federal direction. And at the end of World War II, Van Eva Bush, who was former dean of engineering at MIT and, and the president's closest science advisor, persuaded the authorities that we should, as America, put more federal money into funding scientific R&D, building up campuses such as this one, because you gain knowledge directly and in ways that are obviously going to be beneficial, but also you have expertise available in your society to deal with unforeseen circumstances. And when we, um, we, we published Jumpstarting America, arguing for more science spending and for spreading around the country and, and some related ideas, we published it in 2019. It got a so-so reaction, I would say, positive, but not overwhelming. I, had a, I remember clearly I had a meeting on Capitol Hill in early 2020. A senior um, staffer said, Simon, love the book, but it's not going to happen. We've got too many other things on our minds. That was the last meeting I had and maybe the last meeting he had before everything shut down for COVID. And we were once again reminded of the value of having science. And you may feel differently about vaccination. I understand we're a democracy. We continue to debate these things. But uh, the, the, the use of um, mRNA and the development of vaccines, and I personally regard them as safe and effective vaccines, I think there was absolutely uh, once again a demonstration of the value of science and the value of investing in science, both for what you expect to get from it and also what you know, don't know is going to hit you. And we were very uh, fortunate that uh, I think that some of these ideas um, found their way into the 2022 Chips and Science Act, 
um, that uh, maybe doesn't do enough. Maybe we should be doing more, but I think it's, it's absolutely steps in the right direction. So we can, with, with um, enough clarity of mind and enough motivation, we can redirect technological change. All right, should we do that? That, that I think, is, 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 the, is the, the big question, the question we grapple with in power and progress. Th there is an idea um, in economics that is so, so widely held, I, my, our contention, that it doesn't even have a name. So we gave it a name. We called it the, the productivity bandwagon. And the idea is that if you um, improve technology, you're going to raise productivity, you're going to increase wages and expand opportunity and maybe help people's health, and everyone is going to benefit eventually. So it's sort of an automatic pass through from technological change to social gain and very widely share social gain. That's the, um, this is the hypothesis that we examine closely uh, with Dorona Samoglu in Power and Progress. And my read of this, I'm going to be very interested to see Brad's reaction, because at least my read of Brad's book is quite consistent, but uh, Brad will give me his, his, his own take on this. Uh, my, my, our our, our um, view on the productivity bandwagon is focus on this word eventually, right? Technology change, wages increase, everyone gains eventually. How long is eventually? Well, if you... Um, Look at what happened in medieval Europe when there was plenty of innovation, this period that once was called the Dark Ages, that turns out to have been a complete slander by people living in the Renaissance. There was plenty of innovation in agriculture, plenty of innovation of, of techniques, further development of water mills, windmills, absolutely, um, for the first time became a big deal in Western Europe. Um, productivity, by some measures, definitely improved. The living standards of uh, ordinary people barely budged. The elite lived better. And if you want to see how well the elite lived and how the elite saw themselves and how they celebrated their existence, go to Europe and visit cathedrals. Almost all the cathedrals you'll see on your European tour were built between 1100 and early 1300s. Uh, I've offered to go uh, accompany some of these fantastic university tourism things where you give lectures about things. I, mean, I like to sort of explode the myths of, of cathedrals and explain the exploitation behind them. No one has taken me up on that. Yeah, I have not been invited on any tours. I have no idea why. Um, but so th th all of those gains were, were expropriated and taken to, to the elite. So the eventually there was like never. What about in the Industrial Revolution? The Industrial Revolution, as we'll discuss with Brad, and this is very important feature in, in, in Brad's book. Industrial Revolution did change everything. Industrial Revolution eventually raised living standards uh, dramatically for everyone in our society. Um, but when did the Industrial Revolution start? When did we begin to have those first big breakthroughs? Well, we can talk about uh, alternative datings for it. Some people would say 1760. I think my, I might choose 1780 when spinning became much more productive. The use of spinning machines, those machines replaced workers. That's the essence of um, what we do with technological change and what we do with mechanization. Um, the evidence is, and this is definitely also in Brad's book, the evidence is that real wages, not just for cotton workers, but also for people adjacent to cotton, for people who are buying cotton goods, the real wages for pretty much everyone you would call a worker by any definition barely moved until well into the 1830s. Perhaps I might say, I'd say 1840, I think we start to see some change. So for 60 years, we had technological change we, we, of, of a kind that had never been seen before in the world, massive fortunes being made by, by the industrious, by the people who owned uh, the mills, for example, and nothing really passing through to the workers. In fact, if you look at working conditions, look at hours worked, look at how they lived in the cities. I'm from the north of England. Um, I'm from Sheffield, but, and the cotton industry centered around Manchester. But it's the same story. The living conditions of people living in, in those cities well into the 1850s were, were really, really awful. And we, we know that there were children, this is well documented, there were children as young as six working in coal mines in the 1840s, 12 hours underground pushing coal sleds with their heads, right? 60 years after the Industrial Revolution began. So when somebody says to you, right, AI is going to benefit us all eventually, you want to say, well, hold on, how long is this eventually? And if the answer is 60 years or more, I think it's a very, rare, very reasonable question to say, couldn't we do it a little bit faster? Haven't we learned something after 200, 300 years of industrialization to speed up that process? And I think the answer is, um, we, we've learned a huge amount. In fact, if we'd written this book in 1980, well, I don't think we would have written it in 1980, because in 1980, the problem of turning um, innovation, invention, which human, and humans have always been 
inventive and creative. It's actually quite hard to stop us from being creative. But the process of turning that creativity into higher wages and shared prosperity, that problem was solved, I would say, after the 1850s in Bradsburg, 1870 is the key date. I, I think that's an interesting discussion, but it's the same point. How do we solve it? How do we, how, how do we socially break through on that? Uh, three things. First of all, in addition to automation, in addition to replacing people with machines, industrialization in that late 19th century phase into the early 20th century created a lot of new tasks. What are new tasks? It's, it's doing, you're doing things now as people that you never did before, and you're doing it with expertise, meaning it's, you, you, you're expert at some things that other people don't know, and you, I, your employer can't go out and easily hire people to replace you. And for that, we're going to have to pay you a decent wage. So new task creation is very important. The second thing is countervailing power. So the growth of the big corporations, very important in corporations, um, it had a lot of functions and were able to engage in planning and, and resource management in ways that had not previously been possible. But trade unions, the rise of trade unions was very important in terms of counterbalancing that power and demanding wages in return for, as a share in the raising productivity. And the third thing was democratization. Right? So actually having a vote and having being able to express dissatisfaction with low wages and other aspects of living conditions in cities through the ballot box. Now, you can tell this story, I think, through two particular experiences, one in the UK and one in the US. The UK one is, for, uh, plays out pretty much as I said, which is, uh, well, I think railways were a big invention, railways creating uh, a, a very different kind of economy with a lot of new opportunities that were spread, new, many new tasks. You're in, in a railway system, you're giving jobs to people, um, high responsibility, manage the signal box, don't fall asleep, uh, and or, or drive this engine, which is an extremely valuable piece uh, of equipment, and you're giving these jobs to people who don't have a lot of formal education. And you're paying them high wages uh, to, to to make that whole thing make that whole thing work. Uh, we had the, the rise of the Chartists. We had the uh, changes in the political system that made it possible to have legal trade unions, and and we had the expansion of of the franchise. The United States has a slightly different version of this that is, is perhaps even more interesting, given where we are today, but also perhaps in terms of what might happen next. So in the U.S. There's a development of what has been called by some scholars the American system of manufacturing that particularly focused on making good use of workers who didn't have a lot of formal education. Because in the mid to late 19th century, U.S. workers didn't have a lot of formal education. We didn't have an artisanal class of the kind that um, the, the, the Europeans had, for example. So that, um, those, me that, that, those, those methods of organization were... Uh, raised productivity, raised wages in the U.S., and those companies became so successful, they set up operations back in Europe. So now, people in Europe who didn't have a lot of skill could get what we'd call good jobs, could get a higher wage. We also had the progressive era. We had a, a, a big pressure to share the benefits of this higher productivity with, um, with, with, these, um, with the workers. And, and we had... Um, a, a remarkable moment such as uh, what happened in the U.S. auto industry. Now, I understand Henry Ford is not uh, not somebody whose views we admire today, so don't get me wrong about this. But Henry Ford as an engineer and Henry Ford as a designer of production it, it, it is, is a remarkable story. When he came to Detroit at the beginning of the 1900s, the U.S. car industry made about 2,500 cars a year total, handcrafted cars. By 1929, GM and Ford each were making 1.5 million cars a year, and there were 400,000 people working in the car industry. Now, Henry Ford did two things. First of all, he put car production uh, onto a production line. The story is that he, he went to, um, he visited an abattoir, or maybe more than one in Chicago, and saw how they processed meat and brought that idea to the, to the um, to car production, but he also brought electricity. He, he was a protege actually of Thomas Edison. He brought electricity to the production line, which enabled him to reorganize production in a much more efficient way. So in that experience, he absolutely automated work. This is very important, right? We, we are not, in, in, in our book, in any of these discussions, we are not against machines, we're not against automation. This is how you raise productivity. You replace people with machines. But what Ford did, what Alfred Sloan did, what the auto industry did was create a lot of new jobs or tasks so that people both upstream of autos and in the factories and, and in those companies and downstream, they were doing things that people had never done before. 
These were highly productive tasks. There was expertise involved. They were paid a higher wage. And there was a big fight with the unions, right? which is, as you um, probably know, in the 1930s, the unions prevailed, at least in terms of um, being able to raise their, their wages at that time. So if this is, a, if, if this is a, a problem that we've had for a long time, and if we solved it after 1850 or 1870, what has gone wrong more recently? Because it has gone wrong. The, the evidence is quite overwhelming that since 1980, we've lost many jobs that were in this sort of middle skill, middle education level. You've probably heard discussions about job market polarization, meaning that the way that technology developed and also the way that global markets were built, and these things are not unrelated because a lot of globalization is made possible by improvements in telecommunication, improvements in transportation technology. So that, that combination has meant that people who were previously um, had good jobs in manufacturing, but also a lot of white collar jobs, lost those jobs or those opportunities were, were no longer there and they got pushed down to the lower end of the labor market where they um, there's a lot of competition expertise is not it's easy to replace workers with 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 other workers and you don't get pay, paid a high wage we continue to automate digital the development of digital technology absolutely is a form of automation it did not come with a large number of new tasks. We missed out on the tasks. Task. And we can have a good discussion about, was that deliberate? Was it accidental? What can we do about that? Fine. Trade unions also became much weaker. Right? And again, we can have a discussion about who's to blame, was that avoidable, and, and, and so on. Of course, what, what was characteristic of that early industrial revolution phase was people were brought into factories, and people who had led very disparate lives were now leading much more homogeneous lives. You get a, Everybody turns up at the cotton factory at seven, everybody goes home at six. You're uh, forcing people to live in very similar houses next to each other. That uh, facilitated um, union formation. That's not how we live today. That's not how the modern economy has lived, we've, uh, has, has functioned, we've fragmented much more. And, and then, of course, there is the, uh, what I would call the particular version of shareholder capitalism that has become predominant after 1980. Um, shareholder capitalism has been around for a long time. And, and I can show you speeches of leading proponents of capitalism and, and, and leading engineers, industrial engineers in the 1920s, who say the strength of America is that we treat our workers well, we pay them well, and they work really hard, and they're very efficient, right, in the 1920s. That's not, unfortunately, the attitude of uh, much of corporate America uh, after 1980. It became much more, um, much harder on the workers, much more about seeing the workers as a cost to be squeezed and a cost to be reduced rather than as a resource to be developed. Oh, and then, of course, there was um, uh, Milton Friedman and the idea that the business of business is business. So don't talk about anything else, which is a very influential doctrine. But also, if you think about it, if your business is only business and there's a government that makes the rules and the rules shape who has what opportunity and how much competition you face and how much money you can make, I think it's pretty self-evident that your business includes trying to um, capture the government, to use a University of Chicago word, word capture the government, uh, move regulation in your favor, and, and um, further squeeze workers, if that's uh, a, a one way that you think you can increase um, the short-term return to, to, to capital and what shareholders get. All right, so the project of the bandwagon is not a general proposition. It's not something that happens automatically. We did solve that problem. We brought, um, we figured out how to automate, create new tasks, share the benefits after 1870. And we, Western societies, let's say, we can talk global, international. Obviously, that, that picture is more complicated. And yes, I'm aware there are plenty of downsides to this process. And, and, and we can talk about those also. But that, that core um, element of the system functioned well between the late 19th century and somewhere around 1980. So now we have artificial intelligence arriving. In, in, in a way that I think e even my, um, my expert friends are, are quite amazed by how much uh, progress the algorithms have made over the past um, 18 months. 
our, our view, and, and I said this to you, and you can we can argue and, about it, and I talked to uh, computer science people at Stanford yesterday, and I obviously talked to a lot of people at MIT. Our view is that the, the predominant um, idea in that line of work, so technology development, including on campuses, by the way, but definitely in the commercial sector, the predominant idea is replace people with machines. So uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, my former colleague at MIT, who's now at Stanford, talks about there being a Turing trap. So what's the Turing trap? Uh, you've probably heard of the Turing, Turing test. You're trying to set up um, find an arrangement or, or, or um, a set of computer capabilities that can fool people so you don't know which is, who's a human and, and who's a person. And you know the, the logic of it is pretty compelling. Can I make a, 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 an algorithm that can beat humans at chess that can, or match them at chess, match them at Go, and then run checkout at the grocery store just as well as the humans. And you're like, wait a minute, hold on a second. That last one, checkout at the grocery store, right? Th this is an example of what Duran, uh, my co-author, and Pascal Restrepo call so-so automation. Because if you look at it very carefully, what you're doing there is you're not bringing in a spinning machine that, or a weaving a power loom that is 100 or 200 times the productivity of an individual. You're basically replacing people with something that's about as good as people. You are not. I promise you not raising the wages of the grocery store workers who remain. You are shifting the balance of power between labor and management. You are making, I think, the grocery store, the ones who remain more afraid for their jobs, right? You're, by the way, you're shifting the work onto, on, onto the customer who's not being paid. I think you got that, that you got that part, right? So if, if, if what we're doing is replicating human capabilities and, and replacing people, and particularly if we're replacing people with machines that are so-so, that you know, presumably you're not worse. They're not worse than people, but they're not stunningly better. That is going to have real consequences in terms of hollowing out the labor market uh, and further furthering job polarization. And it doesn't have to be the way, because while that's the um, that has become, for reasons we can discuss, the predominant paradigm in in, in this industry, there is another idea that has very strong lineage and is perfectly coherent, but it's not the one that's on top right now, which is develop machines to increase and improve human capabilities. So what does that mean? That means, for example, if you're a nurse practitioner and you have access to an AI type um, uh, real-time advisor, you can use that information to provide better medical assistance and improve the delivery of um, advice and services uh, to people. Uh, Eric uh, Brynjolfsson and, and uh, a couple of co-authors have a paper that looks at um, customer service. Now, customer service, as I think you all know, is pretty horrible uh, in, in this country. Uh, they, uh, the question is, if you give uh, customers, if you replace customer service representatives with machines, well, you know what that is. That's chatbots, and you don't enjoy that. Um, and by the way, when, when you get through the chatbots, um, you're so angry that the, per that the person who tries to deal with you really struggles. That's the structure of what we're dealing with right now. That's the vision, if you like, of the industry. The alternative, and then what um, Eric and his, and his colleagues looked at, is use an AI um, advisor to help customer service reps understand the situation and provide better advice initially. And what they find is it helps people with less experience develop, deliver better service and there's better customer satisfaction and they enjoy their jobs more. Right? So there's a very real potential to use artificial intelligence to help people who are not PhDs, who are not even Berkeley graduates, who are not um, the most highly skilled or most highly educated people. So that's, that's using machines to be complementary to people as opposed to replace people. Now, can we do this? Absolutely. Could the technology be developed in this direction? Totally. Is this what's going to happen? Is this the, the default? Uh, of the the what the how big tech thinks about the problem or about how uh, other companies use the technology think about it? No, it's not. And and I, you know I talk to a lot of people. Um, I remember I had a conversation last week in New York with some people in the financial sector, and and I and I, I laid this out to them and they said, oh yes, Simon, it's terrible. Yes, absolutely. But you know our our job is not to create jobs. We're we're, we're companies. We're just there to make money. And um, you know we're we're not trying to cut people's jobs. But I have to tell you, one guy said that the jobs that, we, that, are, that are most in the line of fire, the way we see AI deploying, is we're gonna use it for compliance, we're gonna use it to have better control over our operations globally, and we call these jobs that we're eliminating the cut and paste jobs. See, it's the, it's the routine element, right, that the machines can go after most easily. And if you have a white collar job, which has a strong routine element, so this is not the lowest, say, 20, 25%, 
of the wage distribution, but it's the 10, 15 percent above that. These people are extremely vulnerable. And that's the default. That's what we're going to get. So what we have in the book is three um, three asks, because that's, I think, the way the way you do this. The first is policy. So what are, the, what, are, what are the policies we want? We can talk about that. I think Brad will have some thoughts on that. We have some policies that, the, that we think the government should adopt to try and push the development of human complementary technology. Hey, DARPA really uh, drove, or, or sorry about the pun, encouraged the development of the self-driving car by having a little competition to, to drive self-driving, have self-driving vehicles drive around the desert and win a million dollars. That was a catalyst for the development of that industry. Why don't we have some catalysts on human complementary technology? Um, the second ask is, for, is, is to companies. So why don't we pull companies towards this kind of technology? And I did have some, have had some meetings, including last night with people in the tech sector. And again, they're extremely polite, they're open to it, but it's not gonna happen. It's not the commercial logic. It's not what the market is asking for. It's not what's fashionable. So then I think I have uh, the ask is, is, is to you and people like you, because this is not the 1980 or it's definitely not 1870. It's definitely not 1780. We have a very powerful social sector in this country. We have amazing universities. We have deep pockets of, of technology development understanding. And I think that people, if we don't do this, if people like us, are, at universities like yours and like mine, don't take this on, don't confront this, you know what we're going to get. You're going to get more of the job market polarization. You're going to have people at the top doing just fine, people at the bottom struggling to survive. And I think what you get with that is a lot of resentment, backlash, for completely legitimate reasons, particularly because we could have done it a different way. Technology is a choice. Technology is always a choice. We always choose socially which way to go. At some moments, it's driven by textile entrepreneurs. At some moments, it's driven by Andrew Carnegie. At some moments, it's driven by Elon Musk. Okay, strike that from the record. Let's hope that's not true. Uh, but, but why? Why, why, do we defer? Why, do you, why do we defer to the billionaires? Why do we defer to these people who've, who've um, got their own particular vision? Why don't we confront them with our own vision? Why don't we have that argument right now, right here, about what we want to build with technology, and then we build it for ourselves, and we build it for the, for the world? Thank you very much. Um, let me thank um, Steve Simon for writing a very thought-provoking and I think quite good book, um, running through a thousand years of history at a very eagle's eye overview. Um, let me skip past my slide, which has a whole bunch of his slides that he didn't show on top of it, and say that you know the way I like to think about it, you know, there were people of some time or other who thought that if you had to look at societies, you would just start with modes of production. Um, but as time has passed, as we've had nearly 200 years since the stage theory of human society, you know, that you start with hunting and gathering, then you move to herding, then you move to agriculture, then you move to commercial society, and then maybe move to steam power society. That since we've had nearly 200 years since people began thinking of that, it's become clear that modes of domination and distribution are often as important as what the modes of daily production are. And also the ghost of British Czech sociologist Ernst Gellner stands behind me and whispers that modes of communication and justification are equally as important. And so we should have a very broad front approach to trying to understand our human societies and why there is this enormous gap between our extraordinarily technological powers to manipulate nature and productively organize ourselves and our ability to build a society in which um, in which we live wisely and well, in which people feel safe and secure and are healthy and happy. Um, Ashimoglu and Johnson, they focus on production, right? And they see the key link as to create a world in which technology complements labor, as opposed to a world in which technology substitutes for labor. And they warn us very, very truly and very, very importantly that oligopolistic corporations will not create the first, right? You create a technology that complements labor and it immediately leaks out all over the world and it, you have to pay higher wages for your workers and you don't get any of the benefits. You know, on the other hand, you create a technology that substitutes for labor and you can still produce the same stuff 
with a lot fewer cut and paste jobs. And there's the possible road to profits. Um, so they have there, or at least they plus David Autor in their recent working paper, have a five-point policy plan, but they also had a private action plan. And they also had, I forget what the third thing was, um, aside from calling on the social sector. Yeah, you know, what was your second ask? It was public policy in the private sector and the social sector. That's social policy, policy private, yep. Yeah. All right, so there's policy, which can work. There's the social sector, which can work. There's begging the private sector to do stuff. But, you know, there's no money in it. Um, and Friedrich, the ghost of Friedrich von Hayek, would say that the private sector is absolutely, totally wonderful because, you know, if there is private property and if there is money in it, you can solve two of the biggest problems of organizing humans, that is, of actually getting action carried out by the people who know what's going on, which people can do if they have private property, but they can't do if they have to seek the approval of a single czar far away who doesn't understand anything, or even worse, a bureaucracy which follows a rule book written 30 years ago. You know, and the social sector can quite possibly do something. Um, and so here we are, they have their asks, and I think that's great. Um, but I want to go back and try to broaden it a little bit beyond the technology part and to do so by doing what my standard move always is, which is to jump back 800 years or so, um, a move which Simon and Daron did as well, you know, that um, human societies for a very long time, right, um, for the past 10,000 years or so since the invention of agriculture, were for the most part overwhelmingly very, very poor. You know, we dig up skeletons um, and we find from the femurs that people back then were maybe five inches shorter than we are, with the upper class being maybe two and a half inches shorter than we are. Now, um, that people were being fed diets as children. Well, if I fed my children the equivalent diet of your average peasant or craftsman back in 1400, Alameda County Child and Protective Services would have come and taken my children away long ago. Um, and in such a world, in such a world in which things are poor because technology is that well, not well developed, um, and because when technology does grow, it grows slowly, and also because... Um, in a world of patriarchy with slow growing technology, there is about one chance in three that a woman who survives into middle age will not have a surviving son. You know, and if your husband dies, if you're a middle aged woman, if you do not have a surviving son who is going to advocate for you, well, you better have a sister with a surviving son who really loves you, or you'd better have a son-in-law who is extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, eager to look after your welfare, you know, or you're close to socially dead. Um, so I suppose I would read much of the medieval period a little bit differently than Daron and Simon do. You know, I would say that the actual uses of two gains from technology fluctuates back and forth. But when the lower classes gain from technology, there is this very powerful push for the lower classes to, if you have more resources, let's try to have more children to raise the chances that we'll have a surviving son. And that, that tends to mean that things that benefit the lower class show up in greater numbers of people after 100 years, rather than in higher living standards. So, you know, in such a world, in such a world in which the average person is going to be five inches shorter than we are because of malnutrition, in which you're going to see, you know, 40% of your babies die before the age of five because they're so malnourished, their immune systems are compromised by the common cold. Um, in a world in which, you know, even trying to have extra children may not work because you may be so skinny that ovulation becomes hit or miss. And, you know, we don't, we don't want to forget that childbed mortality rates for mothers in medieval Europe um, were on the order of one in seven, uh, that there was one chance in seven that the giving birth process would eventually kill you off. You know, um, you know, in such a world, what do you do in order to try to get enough for yourself and your family? You know, well, you can try to push the technology frontier forward and become much better at producing stuff by having some great and ingenious idea. 
Um, the problem is, A, that's hard because you do not have empirical science or an engineering profession or a great deal of knowledge behind it. And um, also it makes you a soft target for people who are pursuing another strategy. You know, people who are joining a gang, um, people who are becoming a thug with a spear, who is professionally trained in its use. And if you're lucky enough to be descended from a successful knight, you probably have two or three inches on the peasants and height and muscle anyway. Or even better, one of their bosses, one of their lords. And if you're not much good um, at, kidding, at killing things with a spear from a substantial distance, you can at least become one of their tame accountants, propagandists, and bureaucrats. Um, that when we look back at our guesses about how, how unequal societies were in the past, we seem to come out with the conclusion that societies in the past were maybe on average a little bit more unequal than ours today, but not that much more unequal. But what they were different in is that kind of they were 80% as unequal as they could be. You know, that they managed to extract 80% of the maximum amount in the sense that if the upper class extracted even more, the peasants would actually start to die and the population be unable to reproduce itself. Um, and what's different from us, what's different from us is that we've had societies with varying degrees of inequality over the past two centuries, um, but we haven't seen anything close to approaching the maximum inequality you know, extraction ratio. That even in times which are relatively bad from inequality, you know, there's still much, much social, less social pressure applied to create it as there was back in the real old days. Um, and then the question is, how is it? So it's not just technology. What else is it? Um, you know, what else can we say as modes of societal organization? Um, well, let me briefly spend a minute or two on three case studies that it will be very familiar to most of you, just because I think that you know, it's, easy, it's easy to take history as a case study, and then it's quick to ask, is this or is this not a proper analogy? Well, it's actually hard to reason through a situation from first principles. You know, we think of first the mass production age, the age started by Henry Ford. You know, it was not an age in which technology was extraordinarily complementary to the human skills of the lower class. You know, it was an age in which people following Frederick Taylor and Frank Gilbreth and company had attempted to take as much as possible of the knowledge in the production process and shift it into the machines and onto the assembly line. So that your job on the assembly line was to turn the bolt, you know, bolt five, four turns to the left before the machine went on. You know, individuals, individuals were easily replaceable. Um, the fact that individuals were easily replaceable and yet the entire machine you know, was massively, massively productive, um, well, that led to the growth of the task of semi-skilled workers, you know, of workers who, because they had managed to luck themselves into a place in a highly productive mass production factory, were well paid and were and were classified as semi-skilled, um, even though the real definition of semi-skilled, as my old labor econ teacher Richard Freeman used to say, is a semi-skilled worker is an unskilled worker with a union. Um, and even though the technology was not favorable to any one individual requiring the technological knowledge about how to actually operate things. You know, the Metis says, Yale anarchist sociologist James Scott would say, to have truly expert control over and ability to add to production. Nevertheless, the fact that assembly line organization created huge masses of people who obviously saw themselves as very similarly situated um, produced a great amount of worker asabaya, as the Arab historian Ibn Khaldun would say. You know, the kind of thing by which people understand that they have a common interest and that they will indeed hang separately if they do not hang together. You know, what Alexis de Tocqueville called self-interest rightly understood. And, you know, while you don't need that for a society to work, societies can hang on via bureaucracy and so forth for a very long time, um, it's not surprising that the mass production age was an age in which there was a very strong labor movement that was able to flex its muscles and countervailing power all over the North Atlantic. 
You know, plus you had the extra historical long run benefit of the memory of the Great Depression in the mass production age. You know, the middle class and the working class bonded behind a common interest in social insurance, you know, simply because the Great Depression had made it very clear that economic catastrophe could happen to anyone, even if they kept their nose clean and studied and worked hard and were obedient and tugged the forelock. And so then the question of how is it that the mass production age passed out, that we made our way into the neoliberal turn? And let me leave that for later. Another possibility, another case study is you know, early modern Europe in a time of plague, gunpowder, and the market you know, are arriving at a medieval society. And west of the Elba River, we tend to find kings with gunpowder mercenary armies who seek to counterbalance you know, groups of merchants and nobles. And they have curbing the noble domination machine as a strong policy objective. You know, as a result, the nobles cease to be independent military political players and become landlords. Um, when you can't get enough out of the nobles, you tax the merchants and offer them concessions, urban self-government, and so forth. When you can't get enough of other merchants, you can still call in the nobles to be the bosses. Um, you get a great growth of liberty and a substantial improvement in even lower class peasant standards of living as you know, curbing the noble domination machine is something that the person at the very top of the upper class hierarchy wishes to do in order to maintain his position at the top of it. East of the Elba River, on the other hand, um, well, you don't really have the indigenous merchant base to start from. You have to borrow your merchant class from Holland. Um, and then you also have lower population and more wide open spaces. And in order to control your tax base, well, you really need to keep your peasants from running off to join the Cossacks. And so the coming of gunpowder brings not so much mercenaries, but rather brings pushing horse nomads further away, settling more land with peasants under lords and reinforces noble control. You know, how then do kings survive if they aren't able to counterbalance merchants against nobles, if they've reinforced noble control over the peasantry on the one hand, and if the merchants are in Holland on the other and not part of their polity? Um, well, sometimes they turn the nobility into a service nobility, that your land is not yours because your grandfather was a knight or a duke or an earl or whatever. Your land is yours just because you are filling this particular job for me. You know, you have to create... And then you have to periodically purge the service nobility, as did Ivan IV Grozny Rurik or Pyotr I Veliki Romanov. And if you don't do that, what happens to you? Well, then you go the way of the kings of Poland and Lithuania and completely disappear. Um, so even with the same technology, right, it goes very different ways, depending on the modes of domination and distribution and depending on what the ideas are. Um, and now I move into an idea that we had in Silicon Valley in the 1970s, as the hippie culture of San Francisco combined with the, uh, and Marin County, combined with the techno culture coming from the apricot drying shed south of Stanford. And we had the idea that maybe there should be little computers. So maybe there should be what Steve Jobs called bicycles for the mind. Um, maybe you should have learn from the whole earth catalog, not just to be in tune with nature, but also to gain control of your own information. You know, with a personal computer supposed to be the engine of knowledge liberation, as opposed to mainframes, IT departments, walled gardens, and corporate drones. The most famous moment of this, the apex of this mode of thought, is the 1984 Apple Computer Super Bowl commercial about how they're going to make sure 1984 is not going to be like 1984 because you will have your Macintosh and it will enable you to control your information and so act on society rather than being acted on uh, by the bureaucracy. And, you know, they made, a, they made a good, the kind of um, hippie programmers made a good run for it. You know, the problem, it is hard in the long run to make a great deal of money off of it. Although I think asking anyone back in the early 1980s if they would predict that it would have as long a run as it did with the internet, they would have been surprised it worked. Um, 
And so then the question is, do you in the long run have a personal computer revolution or do you have a network communications revolution? And I think looking back from now, we could say that the major effect of the IT revolution has been not on enabling individual computation so you can control and manipulate information on your own. Instead, it's been on communication, hence enabling the global value chain made of production, mode of production that did so very much to undermine the strength of blue collar and semi-skilled workers in the global north around the world. You know, with the secondary effect you know, to root around von Hayekian information problems, so that although incentivization problems remain, at the moment, something like the global value chain controlled by Apple Computer is far, far larger than the command economy of the Soviet Union ever was, and yet it is a highly effective and efficient command economy um, for reasons that I don't think we have completely managed to get down. And when you are lucky enough to look, to lock into the place or to arrange for yourself a place as the conductor of a large global value chain, when you manage to commodify all of the other parts of the value chain and sit yourself at the key point as the only monopoly or near monopoly provider of some kind of input, well then, well then you get a global stock valuation of $3 trillion. But that global stock valuation of $3 trillion is not really a sign of your essential, of your, you know, of your essential key nature in the value chain. It's a sign of the market power you are able to have grabbed by virtue of the fact of settling yourself at a very key point, you know, in the network. Um, and indeed, I remember in 1980 taking a course from Mark Granovetter and William James Hall at Harvard, and Mark was saying economists would be a lot smarter if they became network sociologists rather than market economists. And I dare say he was probably right. Um, and, you know, the tertiary effect has been to reduce your know, demand for subterring information processing, which is what we're seeing here. Um, which is, I think, what Simon means when he talks about the not the lowest class, but the second, the intermediate tranche of workers. Um, you know, think of it how people how people add value. Um, well, you know, we have some of us have strong backs that have been soaked in the extraordinary powerful steroid called testosterone. Um, at unbelievable concentrations for nearly a decade during puberty and so can lift heavy objects. Um, others of us have very nimble fingers. Then we can arrange production processes that are somewhat but not completely automated in which there are lots of robots we do not quite know how to design yet. Um, things when if we try to turn a task over to the robot, it'll break it. Then there are... Um, the paper shufflers, the people doing communication and control and recording and, you know, accounting ever since the first priest wrote down that so-and-so has managed to give three sheep to the temple of Inanna. And so we need to make sure that Inanna blesses him at the next ceremony. And we now have these three sheep, which we can distribute in case there's a famine or in case someone loses all their sheep to a wolf out of the countryside. Um you know, paper shufflers, people who are paper shufflers are communic on communications nodes. Then there are all of those of us who are really cheerleaders. Many of them think they're bosses. But I remember when I went to work for the Treasury as a deputy assistant secretary, Stanford's Mike Boskin said, remember, you're not their boss, you're their cheerleader. You know, they've been in the bureaucracy for quite a while. They know more about it than you do. You're parachuted in on the top. The best thing you can do is be their cheerleader and figure out when they need to be cheered. And then there are those of us who are lucky enough to be idea generators. And those of us who are even lucky enough to generate ideas that actually are useful in some way. Um, point. Starting with the domestication of the horse. You know, we have taken all of these task sets and move them off of humanity piece by piece. You know, first, that once we have the horse, a person with a strong back is no longer really needed to pull the plow. That when we look at the picture of the Volga boatmen dragging the boat from the Don to the Volga River in Southern Russia, um, the far first instinct is to say, where are all the horses? You know, this is steppy Cossack territory. Why are the boatmen doing this? Where are all the horses? Um, Strong backs no longer so important, but 
On the other hand, a strong back and a good throwing arm, you still can make a good living as a thug with a spear as part of the exploitation and domination gang, you know. Um, but, you know, it's a loss of human, loss of jobs humans did. And somewhere at some time, there were people who were out of luck because they no longer, they could no longer pull the plow because the guy had a horse. Fingers, fingers start to go out with automatic textile machinery and go increasingly out as well. But that's okay because as we automate processes, we find enormous play numbers of places in them where we do not yet know how to build the robots, right? Um, for a long time, for 50 years, we needed small boys to grab the spools of thread off of the bobbins, carry them away and replace um, the spool of thread. And yes, it was 12 hours a day, um, 10 hours a day after the 10 hours act that economist Nassau Sr. said would bankrupt the British textile industry. You know, but at least it's a job and it's not a job that requires a full Turing level human to do it. You know, but it is a job that requires a microcontroller and the only available microcontroller is this thing up here that draws 50 watts, sits in a bread box and is on the order of perhaps a hundred times as competent as the biggest neural network. Um, and now we're come there coming for the paper shufflers and the communications nodes and the response is chat GPT and so forth. You know, well, they're not really intelligent. They're just stochastic parrots. Well, guess what? 90% of what we say is not really intelligent. It's stochastic parrotage. Um, most of what we use language for does not really require you know, the full Turing capable, the full Turing class brain um, that we have in it. Um, this is the problem we face. Um, how do we solve it? Um, it's going to be damn difficult. Um, to figure out how to solve it. But I will agree with Simon that corporations aren't going to do it. Um, their oligopolistic incentives are always averse to this. Um, but we do have public universities and even some private universities that aren't completely enslaved to their donors. And they're the natural places to put to work on complementary technologies. You know, and we do have a powerful and well-funded government as well. But don't think that just getting the technology right is going to save us, um, because we need to be looking not just at the modes of production, but at the modes of distribution and the modes of communication and justification as well. I mean, do you want to quickly respond, or shall we open it? Up? I think we can go to questions. I, I, I think you know, Brad and I make. We agree. A, a, we agree. Yeah, I think yes. we we, we yes. converge. You should have found something else to fight over. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, do you want to? If there's a question or two that you want to pull from the chat, we can do that. Um, why don't we Why don't we go ahead and start in the room? There, I see hands up. Why don't we? Shall I? I'll, I'll let you be in charge. I'll get started with just with two examples that I want to bring out. One was when Huffington Post first started. Its way of making money was that it was a way they could sell ads on a concatenation for work that he had not paid for. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of the rollout of LLM AI right now as well. Uh, Jaron Lanier is trying to put a happy face on it by saying, well, if we just come up with a better distrib redistribution plan to say that we we as a community produced all this material, mm -hmm. put it on there. Right now they've been scraping it very, very cheaply and keeping the surplus for themselves. Mm -hmm. What if we just redistributed that surplus back to the people who are producing it in the first place? They say, well, but the difference is that right now we're saying that I've, as as Johnson was saying, the uh, right now the LLMs are producing something that's kind of mediocre, uh, but we can't stop it from from scraping what we're putting into it right now as criticism of the mediocre. We had the instructor crowd here. We had a meeting at the beginning of the semester and an epidemiologist said in March, ChatGPT was making one mistake that only she and maybe three other epidemiologists around the country could spot yeah. in one of its analyses. In July, it stopped making that mistake. And she said, I couldn't stop my colleagues, the other two of them, from correcting something in, in writing that would get scraped. Second example is um, 
fast food. The the point of one of the points of McDonald's and Howard Johnson's when the freeway system was almost completed and people were wandering around and had the money to go on summer vacations in their cars uh, was that McDonald's or Howard Johnson's would produce something that was okay. If you went to something local, you were rolling, you were, it was a spin of the roulette wheel. You might get botulism, you might find a hidden gem. But if you went to McDonald's or Howard Johnson's, you know you'd get something edible and you probably wouldn't get sick. Well, that's where LLMs are right now. Give them another six months of scraping, another three years of scraping, and you're going to have some pretty high quality, tasty LLM opportunities out there, aren't you? Mm -hmm. But then extending the analogy, what happened once Howard Johnson's and McDonald's took over the dining? Well, you ended up with three decades of one kind of tomato available and one kind of lettuce available and one kind of potato available. And that sort of pauperized our, our diets for a while. The producing mediocre LLM outputs is going to pauperize what's available for our mental consumption. I would actually be more or less optimistic. I would say what it's going to automate is the creation of enormous amounts of medium quality personalized spam. And so actually trying to figure out what you want to pay attention to is going to be extremely difficult. Um, we may well go back to having to have face-to-face -face interactions with people before we are willing to actually credit what is churned out. It's just going to be so cheap to try to gain our attention. And to try to gain your attention a thousand times, all you have to do is hit once if it's free to produce. The only thing I would add to this uh, description that I you know, agree with is that um, large tech companies are reportedly spending quite a bit of time in the Middle East um, talking to oil producing countries, not asking them for money to invest because they have plenty of money, but um, lining up electricity uh, in sufficient quantities so they can train the next generation of models because they don't feel there's enough electricity readily available for them in the US or other developed countries. So park them the, the training operation right next to the fossil fuel. And I, and I think that that's exactly... What they've learned is there's increasing returns to scale, winner takes all. So put as much money and effort as you can into expanding these these models, which will be increasingly trained on things they scrape from other from uh, they'll scrape model output into the models, right? Because the the LLMs will be making decisions and making recommendations. So I think this this is coming at us very fast, and um, there you know time is not particularly on our on our side for developing the new tasks uh, that you need to mm -hmm. counterbalance. is a I think a sort of low-hanging fruit question but your analogy to Sputnik at the beginning um, was striking and in part it's because Vannevar Bush in this moment in the 1950s and 60s when there was this extraordinary sort of public organization of innovative activity was of course motivated by war um, mm -hmm. and so the most charismatic outcome of that was the nuclear bomb right and this is um, a decidedly double-edged you know, yeah. sort of sort of product. And so my question is, first of all, to say, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you could elaborate on the role of war and the military in, in what you, with the point that you were making in invoking that, that moment. And also to ask, essentially, in the case of AI, we have people like Eric Schmidt now who are um, leaving their position as CEO of Google to essentially work with the Pentagon and who are explicitly framing the development of these AI systems as part of a national security issue. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there is perhaps some sense that, you know, a military development of these things is uh, more likely to have, you know, publicly beneficial outcomes than perhaps the private development of it. But how are, how are we to make sense of this, I guess? And in some sense, I'm asking, is this something you engage with in your book? Um, and if so, how do, we, how do we make sense of that broadly? Yeah, that, that's something we engage with a bit more in Jumpstarting America, actually, the previous book. I think that... Um, a major reason this got bipartisan support, the Chips and Science Act, was that people on the right of the political spectrum, including in the U.S. Senate, are inclined to see China as, a, as an immediate, somewhat existential threat. We were extremely careful in this book not to play up, play that up. I think that can lead you down a dangerous path of, of excessive confrontation. I will, however, also observe 
that if you go to any conversation in Washington today where the topic of regulation of, of, of AI comes up, regulation as in something that would slow down what they want to do, whatever the tech companies want to do, somebody at the back of the room, almost literally, will say, China. And that ends the discussion. And, and it, you know, while it is a manipulation and, and, and a, you know, a game that, that people are playing, a very dangerous game, it is also the case that when you're developing a technology like this, you really do not want to fall behind the frontier. Because the consequence of that, I, I, I think the development of high-speed interceptor fighter aircraft between World War I and World War II are, are a remarkably cautionary and somewhat prescient tale. Because um, the, 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 the country that had the better, best fighter that could go, you know, with the best piston engine that could drive a fighter plane over 300 miles an hour at 10,000, 20,000 feet, that was an enormous advantage. Right. So you had to be in that business. You had to be innovating. You had to be driving that. But these are machines of war. And, and by building them, you're pulling yourself into a mentality where you're expecting war. Right. It's very it's a very dangerous um, situation. It's dangerous today as well. I don't think China is, is an existential threat to the United States. And I think we should be inventing this stuff for ourselves. But there, there is no question that um, you get more political support if you play the China card. Um, interesting topic. I actually went to a case study at the business school across the river, not as academic, on this subject. And a couple things about you know your question about should we, can we, at the very beginning. First of all, on a can we, you know, there's a lot of questions about institutions happening today. So if we were to redirect technology, what institutions are capable to influence, regulate, if that's appropriate? If you look at the world of social media, you know, how do you regulate? How do you how do you do that? What institutions we have? The Fed, we have the EPA, uh, OSHA, etc. Can we create an institution that can work with technology at the pace it needs to be, based upon the example you had about war, in terms of you have to be fast? But then the question on should we? A lot of your analysis seems to be productivity, wage rate, quality of life, but technology also affects, like today democracy or affects um you know uh, you look at social media mental wellness or if you look at areas of that uh it relates to like how drugs are sold a lot through the internet so um you know i think the should we is a bigger issue but the can we yeah. what institutions how do you do that in today's world and on the should obviously you have some social harms that were not like you know automation you're trying to improve for this you know for an industry, but now the stakes are much higher. Yeah, look, I think that that's a very big and important question. Uh, that part we did not cut out of the book. It's a chapter 10 is about the, the ways in which social media have made it harder for the, our democracy, which, which I'm a big, as an immigrant to the United States, let me say, I'm a big fan of the political system here, despite all its uh, problems. I think you have a very open, we have a very open system here. You can have these debates, you can, you can um, uh, reach decisions, uh, the other countries like the one I'm from, I really struggle with. But um, but I think social media and, and, and the way that digital technology is played out, and this is a modes of communication point, I think fits Brad's framework perfectly, that has made it much more difficult. There's just so much misinformation, disinformation, signal jamming now that it's hard, I think, much harder to, to reach some uh, sensible positive, positive resolution. There are a couple of interesting um, policy frameworks developing on Capitol Hill. Now, I understand these are all, we, we always, these always look kind of silly and we always scorn them until they start to happen. But there's one, that, that, a joint proposal of Lindsey Graham and Elizabeth Warren, not a couple who get together that often on policy, um, that wants a, a new digital regulatory um, uh, bureau. Uh, uh, we'll see if that gets legs. But there's also another proposal between Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut and Senator Josh Hawley. Again, not as far apart as Warren and Graham, but not agreeing on, on that many things that uh, is trying to put in place some sort of regulatory framework to reduce harms, protect consumers, protect privacy. I mean, I think um, someone may mention Jaron Lanier earlier. You know, I think we can be skeptical about whether um, asserting and protecting private property rights um, around 
um, data on the internet, with, with how much uh, traction that will get. But I tell you, we have some we have some great photographs in the book. Just like just so you know, if you get a copy, uh, or if you want me to send you a copy, yeah, I'm happy to send copies to anybody, particularly poor students. Um, we got we and I paid a lot of money. We paid a lot of money for these images, right? Because you get them from agencies that have copyright permission. Um, it, it, it's mind boggling that these LLMs have, have basically taken these same images and used them to make synthetic images without paying. Now, I think then that runs into, you know, Brad's book makes this very powerful, important point. But I'll emphasize it because I'm not sure it came through clearly, which is we have this massive tension in our society between the power of property, which is actually what happened in the English after the English Revolution, 1700s. Um, and, and the French Revolution, individual rights in the American Revolution obviously had, had, had a mix of both. But it, to the extent that people are, that the LLMs are violating property rights, right, that is a, a, a very interesting place to, to stop the, um, to, to at least impose conditions on how the property is used. So maybe you don't get a lot of revenue from your data being scraped. I think that's probably right. But if your data and information is being used to build things that are absolutely anathema to you, how is that acceptable? Right. So I think that that discussion may, may actually go somewhere. I think the other thing that we'll definitely get from policy in this country is a lot of safeguards, much more safeguards on surveillance than um, than China will, will, will pursue. And I think that, that those are going to be the two different big strands of AI, that China will do a, a very surveillance-heavy version, which they will sell to other countries. And I think, um, Neil, the cost of being authoritarian around the world is coming down because of technology you could buy from China. This book is going to be published in 20 languages, but it will not appear in mainland China, because when the Chinese publishers have approached us, they've all said, you know, we have to make some small cuts to satisfy the censors. Like, you know, it's a third of the book. We're not yes. going to do that. I think it's an extraordinary book. Uh, I, I taught it uh, last semester, and... Um, a lot of students from engineering and computer science, and they were really brought in and thought they they said they'd never thought about questions like this, even as they're building systems. And so uh, it was it was a lot of fun to teach it right. and, and have their perspective. So thank you for the book. It's so clearly written too. And, um, <clears throat> just a, a few thoughts, and I, I'm going to um, end with a question that I think is relevant uh, for the president. Uh, you know, we, we have the discussion of medieval England and the canals also kind of a disaster for the workers who built them, the Industrial Revolution. And we have this kind of respite, maybe 100 years, and not even quite clearly 100 years because it's interrupted by wars. And then after 1980, we also have technological systems not bringing about this productivity bandwagon, which you define precisely. So, you know, at some point, as I was reading this book, I was wondering, what are the structural factors that make the productivity bandwagon so difficult to realize? Like, I almost wanted a theory mm -hmm. of why it is that it seems to have been the exception. Even when the Industrial Revolution during the American, the American system begins to give benefits, or the Industrial Revolution in the latter half of the 19th century gives benefits, you do have this at the end of that chapter, that in India, it's it's wreaking havoc. Yeah. So even that, there's a, you know, there's a qualification there. So... Almost I wanted a structural theory of why it is it's so difficult to realize the productivity bandwagon. Uh, the, it seems to be more the exception than the rule that the productivity bandwagon is ever um, ever materializes. Uh, OK, so that said, um, Brad raised the point of substitution versus complementarity. I thought the book also, I, I'll call it a perverse complementarity, which is the argument about surveillance, that surveillance technology, which is one of the trajectories of digital technology, actually increases demand for labor. It's complementary to it because with surveillance, you can actually reduce unit labor costs by sweating labor even more. So you might even actually have an increased demand for labor. So there is a complementarity that comes from some digital technology. It's not just a substitution. It's not you just automate labor. So. I guess this is, I'll just end with this. There's, I have a hundred questions about the book, to tell you the truth, right? because I, I've read it very carefully, and I, I, I just think it's an extraordinary book, because I think it has the potential for really raising our civic discussion about technology. It's accessible to almost everyone. I think it's going to bring the technologists into the discussion. So I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to end with this. Okay. Okay, so um, but, but the, the question that I have is, um, uh, uh, like, what are our metrics for measuring 
whether a technology, like how do we measure when it's making, has a good effect? So, yeah. So the question I have is this, there's a whole, there's a discussion about, does the technology raise marginal productivity as opposed to average productivity? That's one way we could figure out whether technology is having a good effect. Putting that technical question aside, which is very important to the, the logic of the book, I'm, I'm thinking about the EV revolution right now. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important question because it's possible, I, I know this is not a subtle question, but EVs might possibly actually drastically reduce the demand for labor in the auto industry. At least that's one argument, right? On the other hand, I have a hard time as seeing them as anything but wildly progressive in something that we need to do. So what are our metrics to judge this as a progressive technology? Like, I, I think it's it's automation and it's going to replace labor, but I, I welcome it. But maybe with it, the way that you laid out the framework of the book, it would be excessive automation that we might not want to welcome because it's going to decrease the demand for labor, but I welcome it. So how do we fit the EV yeah, look, revolution into right. the book? So, so I, I think the, 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 the interesting point about um, clean energy more broadly than just EVs is that th this is a space in which once we understood how to measure what we wanted to achieve, and once we say well, the, the words of policy instruments, particularly subsidies for R&D, we were able to drive down the cost of renewable energy in a, in a really impressive way. And, and that has changed everything around the world. And actually, on that dimension, competition with China is potentially very good for lots of other countries that would like to get off coal and, and, and oil because, you know, do you want to buy the cheap American technology or the cheap Chinese technology? Well, that's pretty, pretty good. You know, on the, specifically on, on the EVs and the excessive automation, we are not opposed to automation and we are not, we are not in favor, for example, of a tax on machines, right? Some people say slow it down, tax machines. I think what we need to do is race the new task creation. So as Brad said, you know, we've been, we, we brought in horses, we've done lots of other things that have replaced humans, but we've always been, for a long time, we weren't that good at creating new tasks, and then we became much, much better at it. And, and actually, that was somewhat accidental. I don't think Henry Ford did it because the federal government told him to do it, or that was the logic of competition in, in, in the early 20th century auto, auto, auto industry. So I think now we need to find ways to improve, um, to, to find ways to help people become more productive and those people don't necessarily have a lot of education. And yes, that is a bit vague. And I think at the beginning of thinking about clean energy, there was a lot of vague ideas too, but it's also not crazy to say we've got to fix this problem. HIV AIDS activists in the 1980s, I remember this quite clearly, when they when the disease was first identified, they, they demanded almost immediately more federal money for research and development. And I thought that's a very that's a long term investment. Well, why is that what you need right now? And of course, that was a brilliant ask because they they really um, never found a cure, but they found treatments. And and if you hadn't put that money in early and really focused on it, you wouldn't have made that much progress. So I, I think that's where we are in in this. I'm I'm not saying that we have easy ready answers, but I do also want to add one historical thing, which neither of us brought up: um, the cotton gin. So there are you know, two or three versions of who invented the cotton gin. Perhaps it was Eli Whitney. Perhaps Eli Whitney stole the ideas from a Southern plantation owner. But there are also people who, who believe very strongly that he stole the ideas from an African-American slave. Now, e any one of those versions is pretty horrible, right? Because this was a technology which, particularly if it was invented by a slave, was invented to make the slave's life a little bit better. But once you had this, what's identified with Whitney and what Whitney was able to patent, this made it much easier to, to process upland cotton, to spread cotton plantations across the deep south. And that was the complement to the expansion of the cotton industry in the UK, right? And, and, and the, the horror of that slave system, and as far as I can see, um, there was no improvement in working conditions or anything about plantation slave. In, oh, it, and, and to, until the Civil War. So that, that we have to be aware of, of the, 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 the full global picture and, 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 and the interconnections here. And, and it is complex. And, it, and there are some difficult choices. And we don't know exactly what's going to be better. But I, but I think you know, finding ways to help nurse practitioners make better decisions, finding ways to you know, uh, have better real-time advice for customer service people. They, you know, these are small bites at it. But I think you can see what the direction is there. We got one more question. I saw a hand right up here, though, in the front. Shall we let? It does build a little bit off that. I think she wants sure. to give you a microphone. Oh, and thank you. I definitely enjoyed reading the book and learned a lot from it. Um, I guess my question kind of builds off that is um, when I was reading the about the post-war prosperity and the period of that, there was a little bit in there about 
uh, racial exclusion and how some mm -hmm. you know black folks didn't benefit as much. And I'm curious as you're talking about you know switching to this model of complementary AI, how do you build in that that prosperity is actually explicitly shared? across racial lines. Well, so we, we talk about, you know, who has a seat at the table and, and what we mean by that is, you know, ha having, you know, I think it's important that en engineers themselves be diverse. I think we, 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 there's been plenty of um, problems when the engineers are only, you know, white males, not understanding other problems that people have. So having a, 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 um, access to engineering education for a broader set of people, I think that's super important. Having professional opportunities for everybody in society, that's also very important. But also I think having non-engineers and non-technical people who say, look, these are the problems that we really need to solve, right? And so that I, I don't think the um, ex these expert decisions should be left to the experts. I think they're far too important. So then what, what's, what's the right um, framework? What's the right way to get those um, voices uh, recognized to have it be legitimate? I think that's something that, that, we, that we need to work on. We need to work on further. I think the civil rights movement, by the way, was very important, uh, both uh, for direct effects, but also for changing how people thought about compensation and, and how um, African-Americans in particular were treated. And the, the wage gap between black and white people converged, re was reduced in that post-war period. It, it has, of course, subsequently um, widened. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I guess we'll end it. I want to thank our panelists today. I want to thank the audience. You were great.